Hello, dear friends. Welcome to VPO webinar brought to you by Digital Ship. I'm your host, Vaida, and the founding editor of Digital Ship, Carl Jeffrey, is uh, here with me as well. And we are running webinars for shipping industry every Thursday since September of this year. Today, we have an exciting topic, uh, using virtual flow meters to calcul calculate fuel consumption without additional hardware. Uh, our two guest speakers are from Wardzilla Voyage. Firstly, Carlos Losada, the Solutions Manager, and Marco Zelger, uh, Sales Manager. Uh, both of them, uh, they will present a new method measuring fuel consumption that can help shipping companies to upgrade fleet performance. We are also very happy to cooperate with Wardzilla, uh, who is also sponsoring uh, this webinar. Uh, during the talks, we encourage you to ask questions using the Q&A box below, below, and we will address them after the talks. And I suggest that we start off with uh, Carl's introduction into the subject. Okay, thank you, Vida. So um, there's been big news last week with this MEPC 75. There's a making it much more concrete, these rules that ships have got to make ship efficiency management plans and gather data about all the emissions you're making all calculated in terms of grand CO2 per tonne mile. So there's a big driver for shipping companies to know more and more about what you're doing. And a lot of companies are discovering that the traditional way you've measured fuel, which is a noonday report, tank day reading at 12 o'clock every day is not good enough. You need a much more higher resolution view of the fuel consumption. And the obvious way to know about fuel consumption is a flow meter. So that's like a sort of water wheel that runs inside the um, inside the fuel pump. But uh, that's very, very expensive to implement. And uh, there's good reasons why shipping companies aren't looking at that because it's uh, you've got to have an engineer on board the ship from the manufacturer to calibrate it and check it's all correct. You've got to take the ship off higher for a little while. So we're looking for alternatives to a, a real flow meter. And maybe the answer is modeling. We can build a model of how a ship is behaving and that could be just as good. So that's what what Seela is going to talk to us about. So we can call it like a digital twin or a digital model of the whole system of how the ship uses a fuel. So Vort Seela's systems are installed on about 700 ships so far. And uh, But one of the interesting questions which they're going to talk about is it's not just fuel data. There's different sorts of data or different uses. And we've got to go into depth about exactly what you're going to do with the data and how you're going to use it. So that's what we're going to talk about today. So we've got two speakers who are going to give a joint presentation for 20 minutes and we'll have about 20 minutes for questions. We've got Marco Zelga, who's the sales expert for energy optimization solutions for Vortzee Le Voyage in Europe. So he's previously worked in the weather routing industry, providing voyage optimization and performance analysis products and services for ship owners and charterers. He's got a master's degree from the University of Zurich, and he also lived in Japan for several years. So if we have any uh, Japanese people in the audience who want to try some questions in Japanese, we can try that out on Marco. Then uh, after that, we have Carlos Lasada, who's the solutions manager at Fort Sealer Voyage. So he's part of the product team behind Vortzeela's fleet operation solutions. And he, he graduated as a naval architect from the University of Southampton. And he's worked in analytics, software development, and the vessel performance. And he's also worked as a sailing instructor. So, and as I've already mentioned, please uh, load your questions up in the Q&A box and you can like other people's questions so we can see what people are interested in. And we should have plenty of time to get into questions. But I'd like to uh, welcome Marco and invite you to load up your slides, please. Thank you. Yeah, thank you much, Carl. Thank you much, uh, Vaida. So I'm going to start off here. The technical stuff, so sharing. Let's see if that works. Yep. That's right. All right, so good. Hopefully you can see it. Great. So yeah, th thanks a lot, uh, Carl and Vaida, for the introduction and for the opportunity to present this digital ship webinar. So uh, apologies, I've uh, switched a bit with the title. I played a bit with it. Uh, we had a virtual fuel flow, fuel flow meters in the title, which um, hopefully has generated some interest. So we don't want to disappoint you. Of course, we're going to um, describe uh, our virtual fuel flow meters and also describe briefly how it works. But we don't want to dig too much into the technical details. 
and we don't want to bore you with algorithms and uh, machine learning and so on. So we actually want to focus on um, what we can do with them, uh, why we are working with virtual fuel flow meters, and what problems we are trying to solve, what the benefits actually are. So um, yeah, vessel performance in a commercially viable way is the questions, um, is the topic we have here. And um, I'm going to start off. And uh, Carlos, my colleague, is uh, after going to go and um, describe how it actually works. So yeah, um, Carlos and I, we have a similar but different background. So we both have been working with a variety of different shipping companies, um, mostly to optimize vessel performance. So we've worked with uh, very different owners, managers, charters. They all have very different fleet compositions, different sensor equipment installed and board of the vessels. So it's uh, quite interesting. Um, there is different approaches. Um, as Carlos mentioned before, so the two main starting points, uh, if you want to do performance optimization, usually is a uh, new report data on one hand and a uh, fuel flow meter or auto logging system on the other hand. So both have upsides and downsides, obviously. So if we look at new reported data, uh, oftentimes um, it can be inaccurate or it's sparse data once a day only. And uh, as a consequence, you might be missing out of some potential fuel savings. On the other hand, if we uh, invest in fuel flow meters, so the investments such are still quite substantial nowadays, not just investments, but also the, in the hardware, but also in the insulation and then ongoing maintenance and calibration as well. So to get those accurate measurements, as we say. So um, if you, your company is currently at a stage of considering whether to uh, use such fuel flow meters, whether to install them to measure or not to measure if you want, or if you have already gained some experience, but you are maybe unsure if you want to roll them out fleet wide, if the investments um, and the time and efforts are really worth it. So maybe we can uh, show you an interesting alternative today, hopefully. So yeah, throughout this presentation, um, we are gonna dive into this alternative, as we call here, virtual flow meters, how it works, what are the potential upsides compared to the established methods. So virtual flow meters uh, may be a word that already triggers some of us. So I would like to start with this quote by uh, William Deming, a US statistician, uh, who supposedly said, you can't manage what you don't measure or you can't improve what you don't measure. So um, of course, if we, if we want to manage or reduce the fuel bill of running our ships, then for sure we need to first measure the fuel consumption as accurately as possible. So we often hear that from our customer. How can we um, possibly optimize the rest of the performance if we don't have any real or accurate measurements? And um, they are better than noon reports. And of course, real accurate measurements maybe is not what you really think if you uh, hear the word virtual fuel flow meters. So but fuel flow meters, there's quite widespread in quality, costs, there's different fuel flow meter types. How much are we really prepared to invest in that? And maybe more importantly, if we invest more in this kind of um, equipment, sensor data, sensor equipment, so are we really going to get out more savings the more we invest in those high quality sensor equipment? So yeah, maybe you already uh, can hear where we're going to. So uh, I want to take a step back and um, go to, let's say, the real questions if you want. And, um, ask the question, what do we really want to achieve? So of course, we want to reduce the fuel spent, as we already said. We want to reduce the total cost of running our ships, which then leads to a higher profit, hopefully. So therefore, we need to understand the vessel performance, of course. But vessel performance is a wide topic. To, to what end? What are we trying to achieve with vessel performance? So just, know, just knowing the performance, of course, doesn't provide us any savings just by knowing it, but it may, on the other hand, create additional costs. So there's different possibilities. We can look at operational performance, for example, look into voyage planning. We can look into technical performance, for example, um, marine growth and the excessive consumption due to marine growth. Or we can talk about charter party performance, claims handling, 
or even describing the charge party accurately, as accurately as possible based on the rest of the form. So there's different, different uh, topics that can be achieved. Um, each of those um, uh, areas require a different level of granularity when it comes to performance. And also, of course, depending on the business of the shipping company, it's not not all of them might be maybe equally important. Um, there is also different, let's say, savings potential depending on the profile and the operational profile you have. So um, before before we want to allocate any resources in such data collection projects, maybe it's a good idea to um, evaluate beforehand if we expect it to pay out. So uh, especially in relation to what we want to achieve, thinking of the examples I mentioned before, operational, technical, charter party, just as a few examples. Uh, so it's quite clear, I believe, that it's not really true that the more we invest in data accuracy, the more we reduce the costs of running our business. So uh, the real question is, we would like to ask here, and that's kind of also the topic of, of uh, our, say, alternative approach, is there any um, sweet spot, as we call it, between such investments in performance optimization solutions on one hand and the expected gains on the other hand? So um, especially many of you may have a diverse fleet. Of course, there are sister vessels, but um, we're not talking about um, optimizing one single, single vessel's performance. There, um, we're looking at fleets usually, and fleets can be very mixed. There can be different vessel types, but also there can be very different um, sensor equipment on board installed uh, already. Some vessels maybe don't have any equipment, uh, sensor equipment installed on board. So what we um, came up with is what we call the mixed fleet RRI. So, um, this means um, mixed fleet ROI, exactly what, what I mentioned. So the return of investment of one solution to optimize the performance of an entire fleet, where we have different vessels, types, different ages, different sensor equipment on board, etc. So that's what we're looking at here, mixed fleet ROI. And um, of course, besides the costs of uh, fuel flow meters, uh, of, or in general of such a um, performance optimization solution, we have to consider rollout time as well as an important point. There, we, we ask now ourselves, are there possibly any shortcuts to get to our results quicker? Can we afford any shortcuts, saving on one hand, maybe losing on savings potentially on the other hand? Can we afford that? So that's um, say a broader topic. And coming back to the quote from Deming uh, before, uh, can we um, improve what we don't measure? So is it really measurements that we need? Or maybe can we talk about data-driven decisions? Do we want to make data-driven data decisions um, to manage our fuel bill? So, um, yeah, I'm handing over to Carlos, who um, will show you our alternative approach, or you can call it a shortcut um, in a good way. And that should enable you to do such data-driven decisions while keeping the commercial constraints in mind. So in a commercial viable way. Thank you, Marco. A great um, exercise in setting the scene. And it's, um, yeah, it's good to emphasize. We're looking for, oh, oh, most of the time when we talk to our customers, we're looking at, uh, at the solution that can fit the whole fleet and a solution that can help us make better decisions uh, because often um, you know sales and, and also customers ask me you know how is much how is or how much fuel am i going to save with the solution and the answer is always the same zero uh, savings and in fact it's going to cost you money because we need to make a business out of it so it's um, it's important that we are able to make better decisions and that we are focusing on those decisions rather than on on, on, on the technology and the, the, the getting the actual data. But let's let, let's jump into the topic. Let's have a look at first um, what uh, available solutions are there? Well, there are in the in the industry today. Um, Null reports and, and auto-logging solutions. And let's just evaluate 
um, evaluate them quickly in terms of a number of, of parameters. So let's start with null reports and uh, let's look at first and how that, how that ranks. So if we looked, for example, at cost, uh, accuracy, maintenance, and scalability of, of null reports, we all know that um, cost of a null report system is actually uh, very good in, in terms of um, how cheap it is. However, the accuracy uh, is always down to, to the person that's entering the data. And that's um, a problem when you are trying to quantify very accurately the performance of the vessel. Now, if it, when it comes to maintenance as well, we require manpower again to do all the corrections, to carry out all the, all the data checks. Um, overall, it's, a, it's actually quite a scalable solution. It's used in many companies today, not only just for performance, but also for other business critical uh, pieces of information. But if we just take a, a snapshot at how this sort of data looks like, and we try to, um, let's say, quantify the, vessel, the performance of the vessel, we're going to find quite a, quite a sparse cloud of data. Um, and, and it's not going to be very useful for, for looking at the vessel performance. Now, on the other side, and you can see there exactly the picture. If, if I try to, you know, as a naval architect, if I try to fit a speed and, and consumption curve through there, okay, I, I, I can definitely fit the curve to data, uh, but the meaning, you know, the, the true performance behind that reported data will be actually very different to what I'm able to fit by just uh, drawing a curve through that cloud of points. On the other side, we've got auto logging. If we carry out again, the same comparison, nothing new here, I hope. Um, cost is, is significantly higher. Accuracy is uh, a lot better. So in that, in that respect, we are getting something out of that investment. However, there's, two fundam there's one fundamental downside, which is the maintenance. Um, typically, auto-logging solutions give, you a lot, give a lot more data, but require also a lot of maintenance. And not, uh, not, not just when it comes to you know, installing and keeping the sensors and the computer on board up and running, it's also a maintenance on the on the shore side, on the cloud side, when it comes to processing the data, ensuring that it make that it's uh, appropriately um, analyzed, filtered, allocated to the right part of the of the operation, and so on. And if I just take a, an, an exa another example similar to what we saw earlier of a noon data, this time for auto logging, I just want to show here what happens when it doesn't go uh, it doesn't go according to plan. So I've got here, you know again, main engine consumption data, and I've got a bunch of, uh, I've got a sensor stuck, and you can see there by, by the horizontal lines. And the problem is that after substantial investment, potentially rolling out of on, on, on the whole fleet, because again, we're looking for a fleet-wide solution, you end up with this situation. You cannot use this data without having, uh, without going through quite some heavy processing of, the, of it, and also uh, filling those gaps that, that are gonna come. Because if I take those uh, areas where the sensor got stuck and I remove it because I say, okay, this is not tell me anything about performance, what do I do with that gap? How do I handle it? So it, it's a lot more cost and it's a lot more effort when it comes to making sense out of it. And again, if we take a step back, like, like Marco suggested, what do we really want? We really want to make better decisions operationally to save fuel. Um, so in, in, in our mind, when it comes to, to, to large fleets of merchant vessels, these two options, at least as, as we have traditionally known them, you know, retrofitting sensors, installing uh, or deploying non solutions don't really meet uh, those needs when we're trying to quantify our vessel's performance. And we, we propose a, an alternative solution um, we call it the hybrid uh, data collection approach um, because it takes the best of both worlds and it's actually based on a, a bit of both worlds. But before we talk about the details, let's do the quick, quickly the evaluation just to uh, act as an introduction. So in terms of, again, cost accuracy, maintenance and scalability, we get a, a very competitive cost comparable to a non-reporting solution. In fact, it is based on a non-reporting solution. Um, the accuracy 
is based on, on or, or it's equivalent to, to a sensor installation, which therefore makes it scalable and accurate. And that's quite important. And there's an added uh, bonus here, which is from a maintenance point of view. This solution is based on a self-tuning vessel performance model. And that means that it doesn't require any maintenance. It just requires the data to be fed into the model. And again, since we're looking at data at scale and decisions at scale, this is really important. We don't need to be asking ourselves, is my noon report correct? Is my sensor data correct? No. By just taking a really simple census and feeding into the self-tuning model, we get the output. And just again, to illustrate it, because a picture is better than a thousand words, what we see here is, is the, the noon reports in, in blue, which is what the system receives. And the output of the, um, of the virtual uh, fuel model, or the virtual flow meter, is exactly that orange data. And as you can see, if, if, I, if I try to fit a curve through, through the blue data, I'm, I'm going to get a curve, but it's not going to be very representative. However, if I look at the orange data, you can not only see how the vessel is performing, but you can also see how some data has been displaced above of the best performance. And then you can start thinking, OK, is that due to bad weather, good weather? What happened here? And this is, we believe, a, a step, you know, a game changer when it comes to analyzing performance at scale. Let's look now at, um, at how it works. Um, so again, because we're looking at um, a solution at scale, it's important that we don't add any additional equipment on board and we don't generate additional work for the crew because that's going to be a roadblock when we look at scalability. So we collect data based on, on our navigational equipment and on our noon reporting solution. That equipment is there and the crew is already using it today. So there is no extra burden for the crew and we are getting data through already existing processes. We then put this into our gray box model of vessel performance. And by gray box model, I mean a model that takes the best out of all the, all the work that has been done on naval architecture for the past many years. And it also takes the latest technologies when, it, when we talk about um, machine learning. Now, machine learning is a very hot, hot, uh, or, you know, misused term. I'm not going to do that, of course. But we all know that when we try to quantify, um, and it's done even at the stage of a sea trials of a vessel. You know, what is the effect of of a headwind, of a tailwind, and and that process? We take that that same formulation, which is widely known, accepted, and actually, you know, if you were to use anything, why do you not use? Why would you not use? already proven science. And then when it comes to the specific coefficient, the effect of uh, each of the individual factors, we use real operational data, which means we have a vessel specific ship performance model that matches the performance of this, of a specific vessel and not of a general vessel, like it's done um, by using other techniques. And by then, a tuning or carrying out this tuning process over time, we end up with a digital twin of the vessel. And this digital twin of the vessel is able to, is, is able to predict uh, fuel consumption at any uh, condition and is able to extrapolate. If you've got data for a ballast leg, but you would like to get the latest performance on a laden leg or even from a voyage planning point of view on a laden leg, you could use that. And we also get the, the, the virtual flow meter. Um, all right, so if we now look at um, how accurate this is, because this may sound um, very good on the face of it, but how accurate is this? I mean, some people may, be, may not believe me, and <laughs> it's good to be skeptical, but uh, this solution is, is running on, on 700 plus vessels. So we already have a lot of customers that trust in this solution and that are seeing that it works. You know, even when you roll it out over a fleet and you have a, a number of sister vessels, we're seeing the individual differences between the, the sisters. One may be at an early stage of a dry dock cycle, one may be at a later stage, another one may have come 
uh, after being idle for some time and you can spot the difference and, and, and you can see how those difference change over time. And we're actually very confident on, on, the, on the solution. This is, a, this is a model that we have not come up uh, also overnight. We have done extensive validation on this and the validation you know a lot of the a lot of it was done with simultaneous installations so in a vessel we install both a high frequency uh, data logger that we maintain and we keep up uh, very very well and also uh, we take the noon reports and the lightweight um, navigation equipment uh, data and we and we were able to capture both and, and do a comparison and you can see in this graph here on the right, how it compares, you know, the sensor uh, fuel flow data in blue and the model of fuel flow data in green. And it, it, it matches uh, pretty well. And if you were to draw a speed and consumption curve through both of those clouds of points, they will be very, very close to each other. And um, another thing that we did uh, recently is uh, we did a webinar explaining all the more in depth um, how, how it how it works behind the scenes um, and I would not go through through some more details because it, it would take more than the session we have here today but I would like to to ask the question you know why is this valuable why should I take this approach instead of uh, the other two that we discussed earlier and said well if we want to evaluate the vessel performance at scale we need a, a solution like this uh, because only uh, with a solution that is as um, reliable. Again, I mentioned it earlier, it does not require any maintenance. You just need to feed it the right data and it will give you the output straight away. Um, and and as, as reliable, as uh, easy to install because we're not putting any additional uh, equipment and uh, as accurate, because you can see here, you know, if I drew a curve through the green cloud and through the blue cloud, they will be exactly the same. So that enables, you know, to evaluate vessel performance at scale. It's very, it's, a, it's another cost effective or it's a cost effective way of having high frequency fuel data. This is important because over 24 hours, many things happen with the vessel. And even though you may have a very accurate uh, noon reporting solution, you need to understand what happens uh, throughout the day. Was there any you know, speeding up, slowing down that you may not be able to see in the, in the noon data. And also very importantly, there is no data handling. If you go for a, for a high frequency sensor solution, and I've seen a lot of, you know, very good companies do it and do it successfully, um, you actually have to do all the processing yourself. More installing sensors just means that you're gonna have more data. And more data may not need may not lead to better decisions. It just leads to more headaches in processing that data. And again, by using a solution like this, we remove that problem because the solution is already providing uh, the all the technology is already providing it for us. Yeah, thank you much, Carlos. Yes. So, so um, I think it's quite a challenge to, in this limited time to explain how it actually works. But as Carlos mentioned, um, we have um, done also separate webinars. We are happy to answer your questions after this as well. Um, but we, um, today we'd like to focus on what we actually can achieve by doing that. What are the benefits? Oh. So, so now I... ready. Are you ready to go into the questions now? No, no, I think I just... Oh, right, okay, we've got some more to <laughs> I lost my screens. Oh, oh right, here we go. So uh, here we go back. All right. Yeah, so we have seen that we actually can improve what you don't measure with the help of the virtual flow meter. So uh, again, we can um, dive uh, more into that uh, later on. But um, so it's not measurements, but it's data we're looking at. We have validated that it works before extensively. We have um, done this on uh, about 700 vessels. So um, especially considering that it, it's most of these 700 vessels have been installed actually this year in 2020, which uh, many of us may agree was not uh, the, um, the most smooth year in many aspects, um, but it shows hopefully that um, we have a solution that is scalable even during these times. 
So, um, yeah, scalable solution. And uh, what also Carlos mentioned, that we um, are taking away the burden of data handling. So um, that actually means that we can start focusing on creating value, which is a very important point, I think. So we don't do it for the fun of having data, but we do it actually for improving our business, for getting out some fuel savings. So, uh, well, after all, also shipping business is uh, already complex enough, so we don't want to make it even more complex by installing some complicated systems. So, yeah, and uh, at the end of the day, um, I said this before, but we're not looking at single vessels to optimize, but we optimize, we want to optimize fleets, fleets with different vessel types, uh, different ages, different equipment on board. So, um, yeah, when we look at that, when we consider that commercial aspects of it, we want to achieve what we call the mixed fleet ROI. We believe that uh, from the um, reasons pointed out, we have a scalable solution. We have a using the hybrid approach. Carlos just explained, explained uh, we avoid excessive costs on the data front, on the installation and so on. And we can provide quick results by being able to roll it out relatively quickly. So all that, uh, we believe we can achieve that uh, mixed fleet ROI, positive uh, ROI. And um, yeah, I hope this all made sense and uh, it an, can be an interesting alternative for you to consider. And um, yeah, so um, we are almost at the end. So uh, just to say, of course, we have designed our products to fit the wider merchant market with mixed fleets, as I just mentioned. So it's designed to work, to work for, let's say, most shipping companies. But we also know, on the other hand, uh, every company, every shipping company may be at a different stage, may have uh, their own um, special requirements and a way of operating and so on. So we don't say that one solution fits for everybody. But we will be very happy to um, discuss with you um, if this approach is applicable to your fleet as well. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Well, that's that's fascinating. Well, um, we've got phenomenal number of questions. I can see 26 questions was way <laughs> all we got time for. A lot of them getting very technical. And maybe just as a break before we get into them. Um, I mean, it's kind of philosophy you're you're espousing. You're saying you don't need to have all the data. We don't need to go. You know, a lot of people assume that the only way to gather data is to get rich, rich data and lots of analytics. And you're saying we can get practical answers that just as good I, I was actually thinking of an example from my own life in, in parenting where you don't get data about how to treat your children you just have to figure your way through it and 10 years later when they're in their 20s you find out if you've made a good job as a parent or not no, there's many examples in shipping where people make practical judgment on the commercial side i don't know if that's something you'd like to make any thoughts of about for, before we get into the questions or? yeah i mean i can i can elaborate on that i think it's in it's important to to say we don't um, measure fuel at a high frequency level because that's really quite expensive and it gives a lot of it gives a lot um, a lot of headaches without giving a comparable value and uh, but we do measure at a high enough frequency every effect that affects that fuel consumption so if if, we, if you're then able to make um if you're then able to correlate the cause and the effect which is what we're doing you can you can do it very accurately so so there is no you know a lot a lot of um, performance applications were given the term you know this is black magic but in actual fact we're not we're not uh, doing any of that because we are taking measurements it's just that it's not on the on the actual fuel it's on everything that affects the fuel so this question from Santu Eris, how do you calibrate the model? I mean, I, the answer is you, you're not actually calibrating it. You're calibrating it over a period of years rather than a second by second, is that? It's, it's, it's not, and it, it, you, you're, you're right that the model doesn't need any, any calibration. It's self-calibrating and that's how we achieve scale, but it, that, it doesn't actually require a, a period of years. It, it requires, um, typically we expect a, an ocean passage uh, on each uh, loading condition should be enough to start uh, having reasonable data. Of course, the more data you have, the more accurate it is, but you know, you can start having very, very accurate estimations, much 
much accurate than with moon reports, of course, by just having a ballast and a latent leg. Um, obviously, if you do very short legs, it impacts that uh, as well. But fundamentally speaking, ballast and a laden ocean passage, you're done. Okay, so we've got six upvotes for this question from Nicolaus Beciaris. It's about five different questions. <laughs> He's asking about navigation data. I think you don't collect navigation data. You're not doing real-time data. You're, you're doing it based on the noon report. And he's also asking, where's the data store, which I don't think you covered. I don't know if you'd like to... So the data, uh, it, it's, it's collected by... I'll maybe expand that as well. The data is collected by, by the navigational equipment, and that's uh, either the ECTIS or a planning station we, ins we install on board. And that just collects GPS data. So it's nothing uh, that it, you know, it, it's unreliable or it's not needed for critical uh, parts of ship operations. Again, taking the data from already existing solutions that are well-maintained and stable, GPS, first of all. And second of all, uh, the noon data. And uh, the question was, where is where's the data stored? I mean, we obviously collect it with our equipment to store it in our cloud, uh, but the data obviously belongs to the customer. So we are very happy uh, for the customers to to retrieve that using APIs and, and the usual uh, technologies. Okay, yeah, there's a lot of questions about the specific data, but I think you've answered it there. So you, you're knowing the mm -hmm. position, so you can get the speed from that and the new name report as the tank levels, and that's basically all the input is, I think. Yes, yes, and obviously the draft, because that's a big draft. impact. Right, okay. Maybe we can also elaborate a bit on the noon data because noon data also is, is a topic that, uh, of course, um, we oftentimes get the questions. Um, noon, noon, if we use noon data and base our modeling on that, um, so how can it be reliable by per se? So we don't also replicate um, the noon reported fuel consumption data. Um, that's one topic maybe Carlos can answer. But on the other hand, I also want to stress that we. Um, we don't want to implement just what just another reporting system. So we have actually the integration between that new reporting solution, which we call smart lock. Uh, smart meaning in this sense that it's pre-filled to some extent. So one whole purpose today, of course, here in this discussion is to enable performance optimization, but also we consider the let's say the work of the seafarers is already complex enough. There is a lot of reporting burden. So we actually want to make it easier by having those pre-filling functions. Okay, there's two points from Nicolas and also Rajat Saxner about uh, GPS versus speed over water. Is that something you're saying you uh, had yeah, speed over water? We, we can touch on that. Uh, so obviously we all know that um, the vessel, if, if you're measuring, measuring performance, you're interested in speed uh, through water and uh, you can take the, the, the GPS uh, position and combine that with the uh, ocean and tidal currents to have an idea about um, speed through water, from speed over ground to speed through water. How And that's a good starting point. But we, again, going to that statistical analysis and constantly tuning, we're able to detect when the ocean current and, and that those tidal currents are being uh, noisy or are being truthful because we are able to to gauge that uh, by by uh, by looking at how the vessel performs. So, just to give an extra, just to 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 summarize the just you know the model takes in the 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 speed of a ground and the ocean current, but the speed that the model gives out as the believed speed through water of the vessel is different. So we are we are modeling that and we are making it more stable and more accurate than just ocean uh, currents plus uh, GPS. Okay, and you're not using speed log by the sound of it, are you? No, we're not, we're not using speed log, no. Um, in our high resolution uh, or full sensor installations, we do use a speed log and we even have a um, virtual speed log, you know, talking about virtual sensors, that is really even more accurate than, than the, than what we're talking now. And when it comes to analyzing performance, and I've done a, a number of manual analysis, it's it almost just, you know, makes the curves fall exactly on top of each other. And it makes all the guessing and, 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 and all the guesswork on performance really quite uh, a lot easier. Okay, and calculating the fuel consumption, is that basically the difference in the tank levels at noon? Yeah, I mean, that's a mile. That, exactly. It, it's what's reported uh, by the crew, that's the input, but again, uh, similarly to, to, to speed through water, 
we all know that the vessel performance it changes very 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 um, slowly from you know it doesn't take a day so we can use yesterday's performance model to predict tomorrow's consumption and by doing that we're able to understand what percentage of the reported fuel consumption is a truthful representation of performance and what percentage of that uh, many reported data is actually human error so again we are we are reducing uh, we're increasing the accuracy of the of, of the overall system and giving our users in a scalable way better data to make decisions oh, so avinash would like to know why you can't do all this in excel but i think you've kind of <laughs> well, <it's laughs> Some stuff. Excel because uh, excel cannot take uh, high frequency data for multiple days and uh, you cannot do complex uh, multivariate Bayesian uh, modeling on Excel. So, so that's really the reason. But I'm sure you could, you could do something similar if you went for a pure coefficient driven uh, analysis, but you would not get what we are talking about here. No, absolutely not. Okay, so we're going in a regulatory direction now with Santu Erich, um, the Marine mm -hmm. Reporting and Verification Reports by the EU. Are we, can we use that on the reports? Yeah, um, I can try to answer it in a broad, uh, just a simple way. So um, with the modeling, we don't try to uh, help the EU MRV reporting, but the reporting solution we use to enable our performance modules, as we call them, is at the same time also used for EU MRV reporting. So it's we separate the two things, but we use the same tools, again, to make life easier for the seafarers so they don't need to report in two different solutions. Uh, also, shore side, we don't need to have different solutions from different vendors, so it goes hand in hand, but we don't use the model data, unless I'm mistaken, for the EU MOV reporting. Yeah. Okay, so Avinash is now coming up with a question from the other direction. <laughs> if this is so hard, then maybe it's easier just to fit a flow meter. <laughs> no. the, the, the answer is no. I, I, I don't think it's, it's, it's uh, that hard. You know, I think the, the, the statistics are quite hard and, and, and it really isn't uh, something that anybody can do. But the, the concept it is, and I hope that's clear, you know, we, we, we don't take a few measurements on the, on the final cause, but we take it on every single effect, high frequency speed, high frequency wind, high frequency wave, and, and, and so on and so forth. So then with all of that, it's very, you know, it, it, you get the average, so the complete, you know, pie, you could say, of fuel consumption, and you can say with a high frequency resolution, what percentage is due to each of these factors. And then when you do that day after day, some percentages depend on time, some percentages are constant. And you're just able to slowly tune those factors. Well, and, that's, and that's it. So, so Serena is next. She's a data scientist with, uh, with GTT. We talked to Serena yesterday, but she's asking about uh, the tuning over time. I think you've kind of covered this in different ways. Yeah. Asper, do you want to have any more thoughts about how you tune it over time? What, 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 what did Serena say? Uh, Please elaborate on tuning over time. For your, how, how does it tune right. over um, Well, what, what to say? Um, so the... The, the, the model takes in, the, as I said, the high frequency and the low frequency data, and it has an initial, um, it, it always has a previous understanding of what the vessel uh, should perform like. And by, by, by comparing that with what has happened over the last 24 hours, which is the point where you received the, the report, you can then essentially tune to those coefficients. So the wind, uh, the wind effect, for example, stays constant over time, but, per, but perhaps the resistance coefficient, again, which we can attribute to whole fouling, doesn't. So it's about uh, finding out which coefficients should change, how quickly they should change, and um, having that high frequency data to be able to, to, to tune those coefficients. Okay. Um, I hope it was uh, clear. I mean, if not, please do get in touch. We can discuss uh, more. 
Oh, so, so Sirius asking what specific data from the Noom report, navigation equipment. I think we kind of covered this. I mean, it's the position and the, the fuel levels and the draft. I think, I think, we, oops, I think we covered this one, haven't we? I think. Yeah, that's perfect. Okay, so uh, Nick Leos, Becky Aris. It was a long one to read out. Um, you got it. You got to have accurate fuel. Oh, there. So, yeah, yeah the thing we haven't talked about. What well, if there's an error in the noonday report? That's a. <laughs> you're going to figure that out over time, do you think? Or? Yeah, we do. We do. So, like I said, the performance of the model doesn't change from one day to another. So, you, you are able to take yesterday's model to predict tomorrow's consumption and therefore identify what percentage of that noon report uh, is true performance and what percentage is human error. Yeah, so as your model gets richer, you've got much more better idea if it's, if it's correct or not. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, well, it's, it's a very, very valid question, which we get all the time. How can we base our model on new reported fuel data if that fuel data may not be reported correctly? But that's the, um, yeah, that's, let's say the technical discussion of the model that we can expand more. And, and maybe, I, maybe I elaborate further. Um, is it possible to cheat the model? I mean, you could cheat it, but you would have to, uh, you know, spend every every five minutes recording weather uh, speed and, and current. And at that point, you would have to then pull out of a book the naval architecture formulas and start really, you know, doing it, doing it in a consistent way. Consistent with what? Consistent with all the high frequency data that we are collecting. It's, I'm not saying you could not do it. Of course it can be done, but it's really, in, I would say incredibly hard. It's not, it's not something that the crew can do. You have to be you know, a naval architect with really a lot of free time to do that. So Avinash is next on the list again. So he's asking about the, if you can show how, how well you've done better compared to what you expected. But I think the answer is you're getting a model of fuel consumption versus, um, Versus power of the engine, that's what you're doing is. Yeah, I mean, if, if the question is, are we doing as, as good as we, we expect or as good as a, a fuel flow meter installation? The answer is yes. And, and you saw that on, on the slides where I showed the cloud of points coming from um, the high frequency installation and the one coming from the, the, the model. And you could see that the cloud was aligning with each other. So again, if we're trying to predict uh, performance or we're trying to understand performance at scale and you fit a speed and consumption curve through both of those class of points, the curves are going to be very close to each other. And if one is going to take you a substantial investment plus a, a substantial work of the IT team in maintaining, filtering, analyzing and making sure that everything is connected and working, to me, it's a no-brainer, to be honest. Yeah. I, I would also like to add to the question from, from Avinash uh, because he mentions the um, baseline fuel figures and the actual savings over time. So we have talked a lot about modeling and how precise or accurate and how easy our model is to implement, but also what we can get out of that. And there's a lot of different applications. I mentioned operational optimization, technical um, optimization, uh, charger park and so on. So those are all applications we build on top of the model. So if we talk, for example, not sure if that was the, the, the question, but savings um, in the operational profile over time by using the model, we have uh, benchmarks we can use. We have what we call voyage and vessel benchmarking as an application, which then is really, say, the, um, the benefits and the applications we can get out of, of our approach. Okay, so we've got four upvotes from Merton's question. So he's basically saying, look, why don't you just get a flow meter and you'll have the right data <laughs> all the time. <laughs> I suppose the answer is that your system is cheaper and uh, there's a different alternative for companies. So, so I, I think it's good to elaborate on that. You could, um, you could pay, get a, get a flow meter installed. You could um, spend all the effort, but actually, A, like you said, Carl, it's, there's going to be the cost. And also, you're going to have uh, all your internal teams be maintaining this. And, and actually, if, if it was so easy and so cost effective, all shipping companies would do it. And actually, if, all, if everybody was so good at doing it, they may, might as well, or they could also become providers of the performance systems as well. So it's, it's a good point. And, and I think that, you know, in the future, when we are all building ships, 
that have flow meters from the very beginning, that are connected from the very beginning, that will be a reality. However, until we reach that point, um, it's important to look at the whole fleet and it's important to have something that you can compare across the whole fleet. Because unless you can compare, you're going to have potentially a very good return on one ship, but actually the bottom line is made out of the whole fleet. So that's very important also to keep in mind. So another question from, oh, from, from Avinash, so we've got another, another direction now. So if you've got the curve of the standard fuel oil consumption for the ship, you can use that to work out the fuel consumption. You don't need anything else. I think that's what he's saying, isn't it? I guess the answer is that it changes over time, this curve. It's, it, it works. Exactly. Whenever, yeah. exactly. Whole fouling and, 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 and that sort of thing. It, it, you're going to have changes. It's not just enough with having a, a curve. Otherwise, we would all be using the speed trials uh, reports. It's important to have a, a model that also is able to adapt over time. Okay, so Victoria is asking how much time does it take to integrate this in the vessel? To integrate this, yeah, Marco, please. Yeah, integrating fuel flow meters. So this is also quite a common question we get. Um, so talking about mixed fleets, so we also realized that many of our customers have done already some investments in fuel flow meters and don't want to, let's say, just give it all up and say, here is a better solution, we go with that. So it's, it's not realistic as well. On the other hand, there is um, there is also, let's say, a few um, customers who have installed fuel flow meters over the whole fleet. So that, that's where we talk about mixed fleets. So we do have an, an option to, let's say, take in data from fuel flow meters and actually compare them, if that's the goal of the exercise, to our model data, kind of to validate it, which we have done in the past as well, as Carlos mentioned. So we can take it in if we get it in the right format. It's not impossible, but it's not a requirement. Oh, so, so Carlos, oh, sorry, hi Carlos, this is G from Denmark, must be somebody you know, I think, but he asked about weather. We haven't talked about weather much yet, I don't think. Is that something, mm -hmm. you mentioned currents at one point. Was it? Yeah, so, like I said, the weather, the, the weather data plays an important role, and we use it at a again from that very reliable uh, GPS position. We can um, get a high frequency wind, wave, and, and current profile, and we're able to calculate also in high frequency the effects of each of those components in the in the fuel consumption. And then with that, you can build the model. So actually, yes, it's, it's a very good point. Uh, weather is important. Weather is important at a, a very high, uh, at a high frequency, um, ideally based on, on a sensor on board, not just that, uh, for example, AIS. Um, and, and then based on that, you calculate your effects, you can tune the factors, and then you know how that weather affects your fuel consumption. And you can make predictions and, um, and really understand your performance. There was another question that I'd like to, to pick on, also related to, 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 to weather perhaps, saying, can you use the model in, in, in other aspects like uh, you know, predictions and, and voyage planning? And I think that's really quite important. I mean, we've been, we've been doing, um, or there's been a lot of uh, work in, from the industry in, in, in weather routing and, 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 and things like that. So with, with a model that accounts in, in such a scalable way for, for how the performance changes over time, it's, it's also super valuable in predicting uh, voyages and evaluating which route is the most optimal for the vessel in evaluating um, how, how, how the vessel is, is, is performing as it uh, executes that route, but also doing the post-voyage analysis. Um, again, analysis at scale and analysis in a comparable manner, pre, during, and post. That's also another very relevant uh, point to, to keep in mind. Oh, yeah. Avinash is asking vessel performance at scale. What do you mean by that? Do you mean like the, the uh, whole so life? I mean, I mean that we are able to analyze or quantify um, speed and consumption for for a particular vessel with the same with this, with, with uh, and with that method apply it to the whole fleet. So you don't have one vessel with uh, sensors, another vessel with noon data, 
and then you get the results and you maybe don't know uh, how to compare and then you're thinking what should I assume what is the right answer here because the process is the same across the whole fleet you can also understand the results uh, in the in, in the same way from the whole fleet and therefore it becomes an exercise that you can do at scale well can i suggest we go on for another 10 minutes because there's so many good questions here i don't know if you're free if we finish at 10 past the hour rather than on the yeah. hour yeah, we will no okay if anybody wants to log off we won't be offended it'll be on the youtube later but there's so many <laughs> good questions here but i think they're, they're covering a lot of the same ground but uh, um so stamatis is asking about the Comparison between measured data and the model. What is the difference between why is there a difference between the measured data and the model? Well, I suppose the model is actually better than the measured data over time when the model gets really good. And I guess there's lots of reasons why the measured data can be wrong. Is that what you think? Yes, in, in some stages, and, and I, I mean, of course, if, if you have a very good uh, system that you keep uh, very well maintained and you are monitoring constantly, you will get very good, um, you will get very good data out of it. But actually, I have, I've, I've also um, come across people that have had potentially uh, errors with uh, with measurements of, of not having calibrated uh, the flow meter, you're not having uh, specified it for the right, um, I don't know, I forget the term now, but effectively the right uh, size of pipe and the right expected uh, rate of flow. Um, so in those cases, what do you do with the data you've already collected? Does it become data that you need to correct based on a, a, a parameter? And if so, how far back do you correct your data? It's, it's, it's not a trivial uh, subject, I don't think. Managing um, flow meter data and processing it at scale. However, if your system does it um, by itself, if, if the technology and the formulation of the model is doing that already for you, you just need to focus on the output and whether the output needs more data. So there was a question earlier, how long does it take for the factors or the, the, the model to tune to a reasonable level? You said, okay, maybe you need to wait a bit longer. But once the model has uh, converged, once the model has understood how different factors affect performance, then you just need to make the decision. Well, somebody says, do you think there might be a physical phenomena you can't capture in a model? So you may be missing important information, like I guess the hole getting more fouled suddenly. Or... The, the only thing that, that I mean, and I'm trying to potentially act as a devil's advocate of, of, of my own <laughs> technology. I mean, I guess where, where it gets very complicated, and then, you know, I'll be honest here, is if you have a let's say an exotic propulsion system. You know, if you have a diesel electric propulsion, you may, you may have multiple shafts, potentially CPP vessels, uh, all, all of that together, then okay, the, the, there is no correlation between all the factors and the fuel consumption. Why? Well, because that uh, fuel that you're consuming is not just going for propulsion, it's going in, in, in many other areas. And in those cases, this approach, it does not work. And I'm not going to say that it does. But in, in the cases where, where most of our customers are working, you know, single shaft, direct drive uh, propulsion systems, it, it really is uh, this, the solution uh, to choose. Henning is asking if I have to explain how this model works to my colleagues, but I can't see what it's doing. How, <laughs> how are you going to help me? <laughs> well, I, would, I mean, we, we can always um, discuss that. A further off line, but I think I, I've said it now already, but I think it, it's, it, it's important to, to go back to the fact that the, the, the model is, is, is um, matching the performance of the, of the vessel and is uh, matching it based on high frequency uh, readings of the different effects that, that uh, influence that consumption. And and, 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 and that, that's what the model does. It does it over time and it, it, helps, uh, it helps you as a, as a user to understand your vessel's performance. I think really we should discuss more because I, I think I need some background to, to, to that question. Yes, yeah, what I understand, of course, yeah. I mean, it's, we're talking about algorithms, but then the question also would be, um, 
would any kind of formulas or more insights in, in how it actually works in, in mathematical terms convince anybody that it's actually good. Um, but we do have, of course, in, in our, say, very simple terms, speed fuel curves, ways of showing it what would the model say, just basing it on noon reports, like in a traditional way, simple face value fuel reports, uh, what would it say, filtering out uh, different conditions, and what does the model say? So we can compare all of those. And, um, and that's maybe a way of, of showing that, um, say, how much it overlaps or how much not. But uh, we don't say, I think any, any formulas as such would be very helpful in this case. But it's, it's a valid question, I think, always, um, how does it actually work? Uh, there's always a bit, say, something murky in the background if we, if we think about machine learning, AI, and so it's buzzwords. So um, it's, it's how it is. Yeah. Maybe we'll take these next three questions together. Um, so Serena is asking, does it work on tugs on offshore boats? Surin is asking, do you need to have a torsion meter to measure the output of the engine? And Merton is asking, oh, it's a new, new question. Do you, uh, would it work on a, a fishing fleet of 200 vessels? Do you want to maybe take all those in one go? Yeah. Mm. I think um, complex operations such as tugs and offshore boats. Um, I think I, I would also say, take, take Marco's point, take a step back. What is it that you need when you're trying to, to, to quantify fuel for tugs and offshore boats? I mean, those vessels, um, you could argue tug spends most of the, most of the, the, the time or most of the large amount of the consumption pulling on, on vessels. And I, I think that in, in that case, you would need to take into account the like what is the type of a vessel, what direction you're pulling. So it wouldn't work for tug, but also what, what goal you're, you're trying to achieve when you look at the performance of tugs. I don't think that, that you know, things that we, we typically look at when for ocean going vessels like route, speed, and uh, hull cleanings apply to tugs or, or, or offshore boats. So, and then in the offshore boats, again, I think we need more context there. Um, is it uh, offshore supply vessels? Is it um, drill ships? What are, what are we talking there? But again, I would emphasize uh, the earlier point. Vessel performance to what end? What do we want to achieve? What is your, what is the the, the biggest factor that if you if you're able to solve it is going to give you the biggest return? And I, I think that in those two cases that we we need to further discuss. Um, there was another question, do we need a, a torsion meter? The answer is no, we don't need a torsion meter. Um, we're able to, to look at it as we've already discussed by having just the, the high frequency uh, GPS data and the low frequency uh, noon reports. Oh, and there was okay. the last question. I'm, I'm, I'm oh, fishing sure. vessels, somebody was asking about. I think fishing that's vessels. Uh, I would say it depends on the propulsion, uh, the, the propulsion layout. If it's, uh, if it's again, ones that we have been discussing and you're interested about performance uh, whilst you're sailing and you're prepared to send a noon report every day, maybe it's, maybe it's possible. But I think that's, that, that's maybe on the gray line, to be honest. Okay, so the next three questions, um, if it's a high frequency data, I don't think it is high frequency data, that's Dira's question. Uh, Victoria is asking, what do people actually do with the data to make recommendations? That's something we haven't talked about. Samuel is asking about how you collect GPS data if the exit is not a Ford C1. <laughs> I suppose there's, uh, there's ways people have uh, got around this. Alexi is asking about the uh, the cost efficiency or the ROI. Um, or maybe we haven't got time for all these questions, but if there's any, anything there you'd like to <laughs> make any comments on, do you think? Yeah, I, I can take the question from Victoria, how we do optimize fuel consumption, because uh, indeed there is many, way of, many ways of doing it. And um, as I mentioned, every company, every shipping company has a different way of operating, different targets. Again, it can be operational. So we, we do use our um, uh, performance model, for example, in voyage planning. So voyage planning can be one area, uh, voyage benchmarking to have a more uh, a learning approach. So after the fact, um, which one, where is the highest potential in, in route optimization, in, in speed profiles and so on. It can be also in 
in the technical side, if you look at hull cleanings, uh, when to schedule them, in what intervals, what is the actual impact of that. So there's, there's a number of different, say, areas we can uh, support our customers to save fuel. We do have uh, what we call also solution advisory team who is specifically looking into those use cases for that specific um, customer. So it can be very different. And uh, do you want to talk about the integration of the, uh, the GPS? Is that, is that, I mean, I guess it's a basic marine engineering thing, is it? Or, yeah. And the, the GPS, as, as I said, comes from comes from the navigational equipment, and it's a it's a standard sensor, and that's integrated by default to all to to all marine ectis. If the, there was a question, if it's not a, a Wartilla ectis, what do we do? And I said, well, we install what we call a, a the planning station, and the planning station essentially is like an ectis, except it's not. A, is not your primary actus. It's essentially a computer that receives the same input as, as the actus and therefore has the same reliability when it comes to those sensors. So we are getting you know, GPS data at, at scale in a reliable manner. And that together with the NUN report is, is enables us to do this, this fantastic modeling. Yeah, but yeah, it's, it's true. Of course, we're coming from Wartzler Voyage and uh, we, we do have navigation equipment. We, we, are, we have engines as well. But we also realize talking about mixed fleets, of course, not everybody does. And that's the reality. It's always going to be. And uh, so that also means that our solution, of course, needs to work with um, equipment that is not Wartzler. Yeah. Talking about navigation equipment. Wow. Well, that, that's great. I just had to sort of scan down the questions. I think there's mainly covering stuff we haven't covered. There's, there's a couple of commercial inquiries in there. We shall uh, email all of that to you <laughs> afterwards. Um, we, we can uh, we, we can send send you the questions, but I don't know, it seems to take a lot more time to answer questions written form than it does all of these somehow. So I don't know if we'll be able to... Um, I think somebody asking about boiler consumption, but I think you're not doing modeling for boiler consumption. That'd be another <laughs> totally separate thing, I think, isn't it? But uh, um, if you want to have a quick scan through the questions to see if there's anything in particular you'd like to answer in the last minute or so. But uh, um, Yeah, there is one question about uh, a previous webinar uh, that was an internal webinar from Godzilla, um, which can be found on our homepage. Uh, I think if you probably Google um, What's in the voyage and the fuel flow or virtual fuel flow webinar? It probably will pop up on our homepage. It's a cloud-based system. I think you mentioned that. Sag, Sag Pirana is asking if it's an offline system or not. But I guess you need a. We need to send a do need report to your cloud service, and that sends it to the office. Is that how? That's right. That's right. It requires our equipment on board, connected uh, to our cloud, and sending data uh, constantly. Yes. Oh, yeah. Well, that's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. I'll just have a quick scan through the questions, see if there's anything. But um, I think you've covered an enormous amount. I think that's the, the most questions we've ever had in a digital ship webinar. And I think maybe we'll uh, time time to finish. I think. But uh, yeah, I hope, hope you have a great evening. And uh, we'll 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 send the questions and the uh, to, to you afterwards and see if you want to answer any later. But I'll, I'll pass back to Vida for the closing words. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. So you heard Marco Zelger, sales manager, and Carlos Losada, solutions manager, both from Varzilla Voyage, speaking and answering the questions for you. We saw great interest. I think there were 225 of you who connected today, over 50 serious and really good questions asked. I think it proves how important measuring fuel consumption is in your jobs and that we need simply to share more ideas how to do it and ultimately um, achieve uh, better fuel uh, consumptions. So for those who don't know, Digital Ship and VPO has a YouTube channel. I invite you to subscribe and receive all our webinar recordings free, including this one, of course. Next week, we continue our talks on vessel performance management and easier optimization with Marorca, Ascens, KNL Networks, Agreco. And now Digital Ship is signing off until next Tuesday. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.